Well, Jack, given your views on your opinions on uh, international investing, can you give us a little background, the uh, history of how Total International came about? Well, I started the International Fund because I thought there was a definite place for international in the mutual fund industry among investors who want international exposure. And uh, did I think it through in the same way I do today? I mean, I didn't think whether it would help them or hurt them. I thought it was a viable option. And, you know, <laughs> it really is funny that the uh, we started off before we got to the International Index Fund. Uh, we started to internationalize the old IVES fund, that fund that failed so badly. And we divided it into an international portfolio, 50%, and the U.S. portfolio, 50%. And the year after we did that, the international portfolio went up 100%. Brilliant. No. Luck. Luck. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's 100% a year. It's amazing. And uh, you can check it in your little prospectus or something. You check me, Mike. But I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, and uh, But it was a very large number. But I, it's, a, it's a legitimate option for those who want it. I just don't think everybody should have it built into their into their uh, investment objectives. And you know, I think you should understand what you're doing and what you're getting. And the one thing I say about internationals, and this is all such common sense. I mean, I feel like I'm revealing the secrets of the world uh, behind the curtain. But before you do anything on the international, look at the international index. Well, the largest company in the international index is Great Britain. The second largest is Japan. And the third largest is France. Britain, Japan, and France. They're probably, let me take a guess, at 23 or 4% of the total international index. I don't think Britain's doing so well. They don't even know what they're going to do about the so-called Brexit. They're still struggling with even, they've never even voted to, to, to actually do it. The parliament is going to have to do that someday or go back for another vote, which I think is highly unlikely. Uh, but they, they have a troubled economy. They have this total question about the exit from the European Union. They have the, li the likelihood that if they do that, Scotland will break off. And the United Kingdom will only have one kingdom, Britain. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it, it, it doesn't seem like the best of the place you'd want a big hunk of your money. Now, I could be wrong, and that valuations may be good, but kind of when you look at it in this way, Japan, my God, they've got the worst demographics in the world, the lowest ratio of probably about one to one of uh, workers uh, to retirees, raising the question of what happens to the last in the U.S., what happens to the last Social Security recipient when the last um, employer dies. <laughs> this would be a problem. And, uh, and, the, and then there's, they get a, to tsunami periodically, and a very, very structured economy, and very, very structured culture. Uh, I'm just not so sure that's going to be a good place to invest, struggling economically a lot, one prime minister after another, and they don't seem to be able to find the answer. And then there's France. They don't work in France. <laughs> well, that may be a little hyperbole, but they sure take the summer off. And... Uh, it doesn't seem like. And they strike a lot. Yeah. And, and, and Germany seems to be doing a good job. They're fourth. Um, but I only wanted to make my point by using the three bad ones. But uh, you, are, you are owning countries. And to accept the index without knowing what's big, S&P 500, for example, we all know how totally dominated it's been in recent years by the Googles and the Alphabets and the whatevers um, and uh, Microsoft a little bit now things like that as compared to the conventional leaders, uh, Exxon, I'm not having a very good time either for a whole lot of reasons. So uh, we don't really know how to deal with all that, except that these are very highly valued stocks compared to, uh, compared, maybe not compared to their prospects, but compared to the leaders years ago. So, uh, but it's still, just to come back to our friend Arnott, and I mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again. Okay. They've had 19 years to do it, and they can't do it. Uh, he and Jeremy Siegel together. A uh, little higher reward and a little lower reward, respectively. A little higher risk and a little lower risk, respectively. And a 
sharp ratio, risk-adjusted return. It's a little lower than the S&P 500. They haven't proven anything, and they've had 19 years of business between the two of them to prove it. And that's not good enough for me, but they prove it in advance. You can. This is a great business. You can prove anything in advance, um, but will it happen? Read the articles in the Financial Analyst Journal by the professors, and they've got these formulas or head over heels, and they're incomprehensible to me, but they come and they go. It's just not a profitable thing to do. Bill Sharp, by the way, said, smart beta is stupid. <laughs> that was his contribution to the, the debate, which is good enough for me.